And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Anna Elmore, registered nurse, certified hypnotherapist, and spiritual counselor. Anna has experienced three near-death experiences, several spiritually transformative experiences, and innumerable OBEs. Most significantly, union with God and visions of the future. Anna, thank you for joining me and welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jeff. Well, we are happy to have you. And if you don't mind, let's just go in chronological order and start with your first NDE. Sure. So my first NDE um, happened back in, I think it was 1996. I was a student uh, uh, at the University of Texas here in Austin, um, studying anthropology. And I was driving southbound on I-35, the main highway down through Austin. Um, and traffic was stopped. There had been an accident going northbound. And all of, I guess, the people were like rubbernecking and seeing what was going on on the other side. Um, I stopped and then there was a SUV behind me who did not stop, was going full speed and uh, ended up like, I knew that that's when time stood still for me. I had this slowdown of time. Um, I was able to see everything in 360 degrees. It's, it's like I somehow came up above my body. I was in two places at once. I was still in the car, and then I was also able to see all around me. And so I knew in a moment that that vehicle, it was a, I think it was a suburban, some type of SUV. It did not, it was not going to be able to stop in time. And so um, I kind of braced for impact. I just, it it's, I, I was hit, but... I didn't really feel the impact. What happened was in like the blink of an eye, my vehicle was in the lane next to me where I had originally been. And I was facing 180 degrees in my car in the opposite direction with an 18 wheeler coming right at me. <laughs> and so, yeah, um, again, time stood still. It, it froze and the as the uh 18 wheeler was able to stop but my face even though i had a seat belt on still hit the um the steering wheel and in 1996 i don't think airbags were uh in all vehicles it wasn't a common thing so my car didn't have one i had a nissan maxima station wagon and so my face hit the steering wheel and um, so I broke my nose. I had some other damage, like my teeth broke and, and I bit through my lip and all this stuff happened, but I didn't have any pain at all. Um, I ended up getting out of the vehicle and looking to see, you know, like, okay, what's going on? And I saw that this had, it was a four car collision. So my car had been hit that car, my car hit the car in front of it and that car hit the car, car in front of it. And so um, it was, and then my car was turned into an accordion. <laughs> it was like a Nissan station, uh, uh, station wagon and um, it was destroyed. And so the ambulance, the paramedics, they were on the other side, like there was this concrete barrier, the median, all they did was hop over the median to get to me. And um, they took me in the ambulance. They, you know, gave me a, a neck brace and everything. And then I went to the emergency room where they sewed me up. Thankfully, there was a, a cosmetic surgeon. <laughs> he was, he was, uh, it was his shift in the ER. And so he was able to take care of me. And um, it was interesting because, I had no pain throughout the entire event and not just because of shock, but in the weeks and months after that, as I was healing, I had no pain at all. 
And um, during that time, I kept having like flashbacks to that moment, to that eternal now moment when the time was stood still. And so I was able to see, like I got visions of the future, of my immediate future, of, of other events in the eternal now moment. And I'll, I'll go into that later. So um, my second near-death experience was also in a, a car accident, but I was not driving. I was the passenger. Um, I was in Dubai and um, I was with my husband and my ex-husband and he's now, um, we were driving down uh, one of the main highways out in the desert and we were celebrating. Uh, he had just gotten a promotion and he was very happy. We were happy. So we were going kind of fast, but still within the speed limit. And in Dubai, because it's where the desert meets the ocean, the Persian Gulf, it gets even though it's a desert, it gets really, really foggy at night sometimes. And so we hit a patch of fog right at the moment where um, there was this roundabout in the highway. And so we were going, you know, full speed on the highway and not knowing that we were going to have to change our direction. Um, and so just we ended up hitting the roundabout like the car ended up getting buried halfway in the sand um and that car did have airbags <laughs> but um how we got there was interesting because we ended up going somehow like teleporting through this um two pillars that were holding up uh the big sign um on the roundabout. And so um, I remember like right before we were gonna hit, again, time stood still. And I actually uh, had a thought, it was like a prayer. And it was not now, please, the children. Um, my children were five and eight at the time. And um, I just knew when the time stood still that they were going to need me if they hadn't, if I wasn't there, that their lives would be uh, very difficult and perhaps cut short as well. Um, and so we ended up somehow teleporting to the other side of, of that obstacle and um, the tracks in the sand, when I got out of the car afterwards, the tracks in the sand went all the way through. Um, there was no discontinuation of, of the tracks from, from the vehicle. And so it was nighttime uh, when this happened, but in the period, uh, like when the car hit the sand, the airbag uh, was deployed, I actually could see the particles of uh, gunpowder that that were, um, you know, when the airbag deployed, and then I uh, could smell, you know, the gunpowder as well. Like all my senses became hyper, and um, and then so I, I remember uh, the air airbag going off, and then I could see it deflate as well, and so when I came up from that. Um, it was, it was daytime. It was the sun, it was sunrise. So when we went into the sand, it was still night, but when the, after the airbag was deflating, it was sunrise. And that was just like some missing time right there. I don't know. I don't have any, uh, recollection of what happened in that time. Um, or I didn't then. Since then, I have. I've, I remember what happened. Let so. me stop you for one second. So you're saying that your car went into like a sand hill, but then it went through it? No, no, no. So it went through the... Uh, it teleported to the other side of the this like two pillars. There, there are these big metal pillars that were holding up a sign, like mm -hmm. a highway sign. Um, and had we gone through it, 
or into it, we the vehicle would have been uh, perhaps like cut in half and we, one or both of us would have been severely maimed or perhaps deceased. Mm -hmm. um, Somehow you teleported through that and then you hit like a sand dune or something. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah then so when uh, we teleported through that, we hit the sand and the car was buried halfway in. So I had to climb out of the vehicle and then when I got out, I saw that there were pieces of other cars there all around. Mm. So this is something that happened quite, it wasn't unusual in that location. Um, they may not have been as lucky as we were, but um, yeah. And so this time, as soon as I got out, there was a man there. And I believe he was an angel incarnate. He was wearing all white, um, which is their traditional garb there in the Middle East in in Dubai. Um, but he was in a he he got out of a white um, SUV, um, and he gave us two ice cold bottles of water, um, and then he left. And so, um, I just find the timing of that too too much of a coincidence, you know, right at sunrise. What was he doing there with two ice cold bottles of water? Mm -hmm. You know, and so yeah, and so uh, in that incident, I just after that is when I started having a, an awakening, um, and so I started having all of these symptoms like depression. Like I didn't know. I felt like someone had died. Um, I, I didn't know what was for no reason. I, I just felt like this impending, like someone who I loved dearly died and this hadn't happened. I, I, I think that perhaps a part of myself did die. Perhaps I, I experienced a different, I was now in a different timeline than I was before. Do you think that he was an angel and he teleported you through that? Perhaps. Yeah. I think that um, I think that it could have been my higher self that made that decision mm -hmm. and that he was a, an angel incarnate or that an angel was working through him for him to be there at that time. Because I know that um, I've received messages since then that um, have allowed me to be in the right place at the right time. It's just spirit working through through me or, or through other people. So and you were unconscious for a while. I was not. Oh, well, you, I, I, I thought maybe you were since as soon as the airbag deflated, it was blight outside. That's right. So how long does it take an airbag to, yeah, to... Yeah, good question. It happens very quickly, very quickly. So from the time that an airbag, the airbag deployed to the time that it was deflating, that that's that was sunrise. So there was that missing time. Mm -hmm. Was it possible then that this guy was an ET? Because usually missing time is with ETs. You know, anything is possible. I I do have I do feel a strong connection to my star family, and I always have since I was a child. But back then, I was very much in the world of the world. Um, I, I had no conscious connection, you know. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, um, that that was the beginning of my awakening. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in Dubai, it's very interesting because <clears throat> all these places that I've traveled, like Bosnia, Dubai, and I have uh, ancestors there. And so, uh, I, I think that I was going to all these places where like for my DNA to be activated, perhaps for memories to start, um, coming through. And so, yeah, that I was there for three years. And, um, in those three years, I, I just opened up and my, my awareness um, just opened up to multi the multi multi-dimensional reality that is existence. Mm. And so 
Well, you said that you felt as if somebody had died. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's possibly a place where you have lived before and died? Perhaps, yeah. I, I, anything is possible. Um, I, I know that, um, you know, I, I did like ancestry. Um, what is it? Where you, you send in your... Um, your saliva to be tested okay. and then they tell you where you're from, you mm -hmm. know, where your ancestry. And so, um, I have some ancestry from the Middle East, like Arab descent and also from, uh, Celtic and, um, Spanish and, you know, all these other places. And I actually, uh, since then I remember, um, past lives in, in these places. So I, I definitely think that uh, we are our ancestors, mm. and um, I, I've I never in my life planned on going to the Middle East or or uh, Bosnia. You know all these places that I've been to. It just I just said yes. I just said yes, and I and I went. You know, uh, and um, amazing things happened there. Maybe so. you planned it out pre-birth. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, absolutely. All these uh, l major life-changing experiences, I think, were pre-planned. Mm -hmm. Let's move to your third NDE. Sure, sure. Um, the third NDE happened again back in Austin. And um, this time I was going northbound on I-35. And um, so... I had a blowout and it happened. My, my right two tires, I was going probably about 70 miles an hour, which is only, you know, five miles an hour faster than the speed limit, but it's still pretty fast to have a blowout. And so, um, I lost control of the vehicle and I ended up like fish, fish tailing on across the, the three, uh, rows of highway and miraculously I did not hit anyone no it's just I just saw everything flying by me another 18 wheeler as well um, and so I spun and right before I hit the concrete median I I remember having another prayer another thought as the time slowed down and um, basically it, it was you know, please not now, let me be of service. And um, so as soon as I thought that, I hit and I didn't feel any pain again, although I did have some minor injuries. Um, and then my car caught fire. <laughs> and um, so that, you know, that's why I got out of the vehicle. And as soon as I got out, there was a, a man behind me who had stopped in his vehicle, a white van. He was wearing a white T-shirt and, and jeans. And I think he was either an angel incarnate or um, someone whose spirit was using. And so he protected me from getting hit by all these other cars who were going by. And um, his he was deaf and mute and so he we communicated via text and his name was silent bear which is a native american name and um i have a a connection a deep connection to native american culture as well now and um so you know that was the the last and final uh nde like experience that i had where I had this expansion of my consciousness, of my awareness, and um, this time dilation, and um, this realization that um, we are much more than these physical vessels, and that um, we are not alone, that, that we are always, um, always being looked after. You know, even even when something uh, apparently uncomfortable happens to us, and so um, yeah, I I had a a fear. You can you you may um, 
understand a very understandable fear of, of like driving anywhere that I hadn't been before after these accidents. Um, and so I had some uh, past life regression. Um, this actually happened after my second accident. I, I had my past life regression um, where I, I died in a vehicle accident. But back then it was um, like an ox cart or a mule cart. Um, and so after that, I realized that, oh, I, I don't, I already died that way. I'm not going to die like that again. So I have, you know, no fear. And what's funny is that, um, my, uh, instructor in this life, my driving instructor was a race car driver. <laughs> so I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, my fearlessness. And, and now I'm very careful, you know, after having children and, and things like that, um, but yeah, so those were my um, near-death experiences. I never lost consciousness. I did have an out-of-body experience each time and um, an expansion of my consciousness and awareness. And then, but those experiences, they actually were just the beginning um, of my awakening. And since then, I have had some life-changing, uh, spiritually transformative experiences due to um, uh, lucid dreaming, due to psychedelics, due to meditation. Um, and so I decided to become um, a nurse. And um, I was a nurse, actually. I graduated. That was my second career. I graduated right May 2020 in like the heat of the pandemic. And so um, I was an ICU nurse. I got to see some of, of what was happening uh, from, you know, firsthand experience. Uh, at the same time that I was working in the ICU, I was also a breathwork instructor. Uh, I'm also a yogi, a yoga teacher. And so um, I got to see two different perspectives of, of reality, two different, um, totally different perspectives on reality. I realized, you know what, I, every, anything you believe, whatever you believe is your reality. That is how powerful we are. The mind is that powerful. Um, and so that can either be used for our own good or our own detriment. It depends who's in control of your mind. Are you in control of your mind or is someone else? And so that's when I decided to leave nursing, well, in the clinical environment. And I became a, uh, a facilitator for psychedelics, um, working with um, the Mission Within organization based out of Baja, California. Uh, they help veterans uh, with PTSD and their families using psychedelic therapy. And so um, I did uh, some psychedelics myself in order to heal myself um, and also to um, gather knowledge and wisdom. And so during um, a lot of these experiences, I, I just further was able to go into um, different multidimensional spaces and expanded consciousness that reminded me of, of an even more powerful uh, version of, of what I experienced in the car accidents, that, that awareness, that, that level of consciousness. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, and then I decided to leave the world of psychedelics because I, I see them as, um, they're very important and they, they can save lives. Um, but I also see them like training wheels. You don't need them. You can get there with meditation and it's actually healthier. Um, it's, it's less 
uh, stressful, less harsh on the nervous system and on the psyche. So um, yeah, so right now that's what I do is um, I do guided meditation and certified hypnotherapy and uh, spiritual counseling based on my own experiences, what has worked for me and for um everyone who's who's guided to, to work with me so yeah what type of meditation do you recommend um so this it's everyone is different um whatever works for you um you know some people like guided meditation or with music um i myself prefer different flavors like different flavors of ice cream i enjoy spending time in nature um just dissolving into my senses into the sounds into the the fragrances into the energy around me um sometimes i just you know just have quiet time um in 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 a sacred space whether it be in your bedroom or um at an altar you know whatever brings you closer to source and source is that which you are that is unconditional love that is um the the truest form of of who you really are anything else is a distortion um and so going to the most absolute the most um distilled version of yourself is is the goal for me during meditation and and what i help others as well do. Well, for most of your life, you've had out-of-body experiences. Mm-hmm. How did that start? Sure. So um, as far back as I can remember, I remember just, um, you know, leaving my body. Like I'd walk out of my house. <laughs> I'd walk out at night. I knew it was nighttime. And I would leave through like the garage instead of the front door for some reason. And I'd run up the driveway and then I would just take off and go flying around the neighborhood. And this happened um, when I was in Fort Hood. This happened when I was here in Austin. Um, I think this happened when I was in Panama too, as as a child in Panama in the canal zone, because I remember I would have nightmares of like falling into the canal. Um, It was huge (laughs) as a kid. But I remember, you know, like flying around the neighborhood, seeing certain things from above that I could not have seen just walking around the neighborhood, you know, seeing certain things um, on tops of roofs and then certain like a cactus garden. I remember that was one of my first memories as a kid uh, in Fort Hood because I don't particularly like cactus. When I was a kid, I thought they were really mean. But I, I just know that they're just protecting themselves, you know. But um, for some reason, uh, like the next day, I went walking around and I saw the garden that I saw when I was flying around uh, in my astral form. And so then I knew, oh, this is real. This isn't just a dream. And so um, every night I would get out of my body and I'd fly around and then I would go to other realms, not just flying around my neighborhood or the city. Um, In the astral form, I was able to go underwater because I didn't need to breathe. And I was able to go into space because you can't, you you know, you don't need, you don't have to worry about gravity. The, The laws of physics are totally different. And so I was totally free. <clears throat> and then I started having uh, guides show up. And um, one guide was uh, an angelic being in the form of, of a horse with wings, so like a pegasus. Um, and it took me places where I couldn't go by myself. It took me into the higher realms of like what we call heaven. And so what a lot of people call heaven and hell are just different strata, different sides of the spectrum of the astral plane. And so um, I've been to to a lot of them to, to 
some of the lower levels and some of the higher levels as well. And um, just gathering knowledge and wisdom and just having wonderful experiences, um, healing all aspects of myself, of this life, as well as past lives, um, a lot of ancestral healing as well. So yeah, that has been a, a lifelong experience. And at first I thought, you know, everybody does this. And I think we do, but a lot of us just don't remember. Um, and, you know, the more that you work with it, the more that you have the intention to remember, the more you will, and the do more you'll actually be able to control the dream. Mm -hmm. Do you think all dreams are astral traveling, not just some kind of imaginary event in our brain? So I think that uh, not all dreams are. A lot of dreams are just the subconscious trying to um, put things in order. Um, but when we have lucid experiences where, and, and very like realistic, vivid experiences, I think that those are, they are um, traveling in the astral plane. And then I also think that when we have, sometimes when we have no memory of it, it's also because we just go to the void. More often than not, I think we just go to the void and we basically download everything into it. Well, yeah. as a nurse, you probably know that science would say that for most of the time we're asleep, we're in a, I don't know what brainwave state we're in, but we're basically like unconscious. And just towards the end, when we're about to wake up is when we start dreaming. And I've mm -hmm. wondered, are we really unconscious or maybe like you just said, we're in the void and don't remember it? Yes. Yeah. So I see it like, yes, a lot of times we're in the void. A lot of times we are actually having experiences in parallel lives. So I've had a lot of spontaneous memories of past or parallel lives because everything is happening now. Um, and that can happen, that can happen in the dream state. The astral plane is where we can, it's like everything comes together. So if you are in form, like in physical form, you can still interact with those who are also in physical form, but, and, uh, those who are out of body, who no longer have a physical body, which can be other aspects of yourself. Uh, it can be deceased loved ones, it can be ascended masters, it can be um, interdimensional beings or extraterrestrials, yeah. Were you raised in a religious household? And if not, or so, how have you changed? So I was raised Catholic, but um, I never felt any um, real connection to the religion. I remember... Uh, as a kid, I mean, I even went to Sunday school and um, I would ask questions and they were not able to answer them to my <laughs> sufficiently for me. So I remember um, I, I just left the church after my first um, <laughs> confession because, you know, I, I was like, why do I need to confess in, to somebody, you know, in a dark room who I can't see his face? Why, do, why can't I just talk to God? And, you know, I, I think I was like, what, 12 years old at the time, maybe a little bit older. I don't remember, 14. But, um, you know, I had to make up, I had to lie. I had to make something up to confess. And it was, it was just stupid. I was like, no, this is, this isn't right. I knew even then that this is, this is wrong. But after that, um, I became very scientific, very scientific agnostic. And so I just didn't really believe in anything. I thought, you know, I loved studying other cultures and other religions, but I thought that there it was like a mass delusion <laughs> um, until I until I woke up and I realized that everything is God experiencing itself with different levels of consciousness. So you believe that God separates itself into billions, if not trillions, of pieces. To experience everything mm -hmm. and then yes. when we go back we are god again so um i think it just depends if so 
I had um, an experience like when I when I had my experience of union with God, I it was like waking up from the dream of Anna. I woke up from the dream of Anna. Anna did not exist. The universe didn't exist. Earth, nothing. All of it was just in my head, in my consciousness. I was in the void. I wasn't in the void. I was the void. I was pure consciousness. I knew that I was everything that ever was and ever would be. And I was in the eternal now moment. And I knew that I always would be. And I always, you know, and and so I could see, you know, it was just, I could see my own thoughts before they manifest. I could see God's thoughts before they manifest. And they look like um, sacred geometry, like fractals. Um, and they have a color. Even though it was black, like there was nothing, no stars, nothing. I was that vast, infinite awareness. And and then I I had I remember my first thought. And that thought was, who am I? Like, what is this? Who am I? And as soon as I had that thought, I had there was this explosion, this epic, heart-wrenching roar, but it was a silent roar. And that that burst forth from my heart. And that was the Big Bang, the first original Big Bang. Since then, I've experienced multiple other Big Bangs. And they were not so heart-wrenching. Um, they actually were um, with the thought of let there be light and with joy and with laughter and just with the, the awareness that the illusion of separation is only temporary mm. and that eternity is a long time, but there are many multiple eternities. I think it's fascinating how you said that you were the void. And I need to remember that because I have so many near death experiencers that go to the void to see if they actually feel like they were it. Yes. Yeah. Cause there's, there's different voids. There's like the void of space, which is not actually a void because there's still stars and planets and gases and, you know, other life there. And in the void that I, that I was, there was nothing except me, pure consciousness. And it was totally neutral. There was no duality. There was no good. There was no evil. Everything was just neutral because there was only me and so when i came back into form as anna um this happened like i call it this my seven day samadhi it happened over seven days so every time i would i would sleep i anna would disappear and i was the void and every time i would anna would wake up I would come back into form as particles of light coming through my heart in like the shape of a, of a torus, like a toroidal field. And so um, that is how Anna and the universe came into form for seven days. And I realized that everything is just a projection of my consciousness. So my universe I am just a projection of your consciousness. You are just a projection of my consciousness. So it's it's what if you want to change the world, the best thing to do is to change yourself. And you will and that's what I've I've started doing now is is just focusing on myself, focusing on being love, focusing on what I want to create. Um and yeah, my, my life has changed and, and I'm able to touch other aspects of myself um, who, who want to do the same thing too. When you were the void and you asked yourself, who am I? Mm -hmm. Is that when you got the realization that you are God? No, no. So I, I was, I was the void. I was pure consciousness and 
I instantly knew that I was all that is. I am. There's nothing that I am not. And when I asked, who am I? That is when I instantly, that's when, you know, I, that's when I created separation because just that thought it's, it creates like instantly the, the assumption that there's anything other than myself. Okay. So that's interesting. So at that point, then you separated from everything just by asking or wondering who you were. I separated into everything. Into. Yeah. I thought you were everything and then you. So I was nothing. I was just pure consciousness. Okay. I was the void. Okay. And then when I asked that question is when instantaneously there was the big bang. That that was how creation came into existence. That is how uh, the the physical dimension came into existence. So looking back at um like mythology um in hindu tradition even in um like greek tradition or roman tradition where you you have like um zeus and athena who was born from the mind from the head of zeus that's something similar to i i can i can now understand where that mythology comes from because the void is like the mind and the womb of god so the thoughts are are like the seeds all and and that is who we are so our thoughts are like seeds and then when they manifest is is when when they're actually born and so like the physical plane it is inside of the mind of God, but it is also like the light, the light, what we call source, that is the heart of God. And that's where Christed beings, aspects of ourselves all come from. And that's why it is, they are pure love. And um, yeah, and, and we are, so when I had that for days afterwards, I had this feeling of longing it was so intense and so painful that that feeling of separation i could have easily i would have been happy to to die because i just wanted to be together again um it was a love and a longing that was so powerful it was almost too much for my physical vessel to contain and um so i i asked for it to end you know, I couldn't take it anymore. I was like, either take me or finish this. You know, I can't, I can't feel that the longing that we are loved so much. We are loved more than we can possibly imagine. We are worthy because we exist. We are all thoughts in the mind of God. You know, Anna is Anna is, is a lucid dream in the mind of God. And Jeff is a lucid dream in the mind of God. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it was pretty epic integrating all of that. And I'm, I think I, I still do it a little bit every day because, um, you know, since then I've, I've had experiences where, um, I remember, I, 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 I have, <laughs> it's hard to put into words. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, like if, if there's, if I could say I was any religion, it would be love. Love is my religion now. Have you had visions of the future? Yes. How do you yeah. have them? So now just going into that eternal now moment, I can see all, all the possible trajectories, you know, from, from the here now. Um, but when, when I, the first time I received visions of the future was back in 2013. And, um, this was while in the astral, uh, traveling in the astral plane. Um, I was brought to a higher level by a guide who I have no previous memory of, but who, when I, 
when she when she came to me, there was an instant recognition, like a heart connection, as if she were my sister. And she was Native American, and I could feel her warmth, and somehow we had a, a connection. So I'm guessing we hang out in between lives, right? And so um, she took me to a higher plane where um, there was this gathering of thousands of other be of other beings and um there was it so it was like um it reminds me a lot of Yellowstone because there were you know evergreen trees there was this river um there were like mountains and then there was this clearing and in the clearing there was this um this table that was like a, a conference table, but it was as it went out as far as the eye could see. And there were thousands of people sitting on either side of it. But the table itself, it was like um kind of like a, a holographic um kind of like a like a an iPad, I guess, but it projected images and everybody could see something in front of them that that was related to why that why we were there and um so as we landed there um i could see the over the shoulders of the the three people who who were nearest to me and so they what i saw was um the three things that were soon to be so in, in that space, it was, again, the eternal now moment. So I knew instantaneously that what I was shown was events that were soon to be, that are happening now. And it's like the timeline that we were on. And so what I, I saw was fires, wildfires all over the planet. Um, and that was the first image. And then the second image was... Um, just human strife, um, particularly um, young children come being pulled out of like concrete dust. And, and I knew just by in that state, you know, everything just by being in the presence, you know, every little detail. So I knew that these were wildfires that were all over the planet. I knew that, you know, this was years before they actually happened. So I knew that the Amazon was going to catch on fire. I knew Australia was going to catch a fire. I knew that the tundra in Siberia was going to catch on fire. And then, of course, the wildfires in Texas and California and other places, like the whole world. This is like a purge, like a clearing, Mother Earth. And, um, and then I knew that the concrete you know, the children being pulled, I knew that that was, uh, had to do with the Middle East, with, with Israel and Gaza. And I didn't know where, I didn't even know what Gaza was at the time, you know. Um, and then the final one that I was shown, um, the very last one, it was some, an image that kept fading back and forth between two, two images. And one was, um, like kind of apocalyptic, like total devastation. And then the other one was, um, like heaven on earth. And I, I, I was like, how, how is that? What, how does that work? And so, um, later on I got clarity on that, but so all of that actually happened very quickly. And as I arrived, there was someone who arrived there to greet me and we were all waiting for him and he arrived and um, I recognized him. I didn't know who he was at the time. I had no, no um, previous spiritual practice, nothing, you know, when this happened. Um, but he was, I, I recognized him as one of the archangels. He did not have wings but I knew he was thousands, if not millions of years old, just being in his presence. He was 
he, you know, there was something in me that instantly recognized his authority. And he was just uh, incredibly beautiful, but also very serious. Like, okay, we are here to do business, you know? Uh, and and so I, I knew that we were all there to prepare for what was to come, you know? And um, you may have been there too. You may have been one of those people at that table. Well, can yeah. you give us some clarity on what's going on between apocalypse and paradise? Are those two possibilities or does one follow the other? So, yes. <laughs> so, what what I have come to understand since then is that both will happen or have already happened that earth is just a shadow. This experience that we are having right now is just a shadow of heaven, or what some people call heaven. Um, and we've already done this. We are coming back to heal, to correct this timeline. And this is how we achieve self-mastery through perceived limitation. And so this what we experience depends on our choices right do we choose to live fearlessly do we choose to live compassionately if we do then we will experience heaven on earth if we don't then we may not we may just um you know go out of the body, leave the body. But what's happening right now is we're being given an opportunity to make an evolutionary leap in consciousness as a collective with the planet, with Mother Earth. She is conscious. Everything is conscious. Um, but she is like an, her, she has a soul, which is like an archangel herself. And she is evolving. Everything is evolving right now. We are coming to an end of an age. And this is a tradition that um, goes through many cultures. And this is where the anthropology in me, the anthropologist in me comes out. So this is a cycle. And we are coming to the end and the beginning of a cycle and it, it goes by many names in different cultures. Um, it is uh, like in Hindu tradition, it's called Kali Yuga and we're moving from Kali Yuga into Sat Yuga from, you know, like a darker age into the golden age, um, you know, the into the age of Aquarius, you know, in the new age culture. But um, yeah, since you know, in Mesoamerica, this was called um, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent who brings knowledge and wisdom to humanity. And this is a celestial event. Uh, it's a cosmic event. And it's not just happening here on Earth. It's happening throughout the solar system and the cosmos. And so, yeah, that's how the evolution of consciousness goes. It's a, it's a, it's not just like a cycle, but it's also like, um, like a corkscrew or like a, a screw. Um, so right now we are at the lowest level in our evolution for this cycle, but we're still higher than we were the last time we were in this same space, in this same place. And so the the next high is going to be higher than any high before. And the next low is also going to be higher than every low before. Do you have a timeline for when this final vision will happen? In our lifetime. I was shown it would, I was shown what, I, I don't look a lot different than what I do now. Mm. And yeah, and it could happen this year. It could happen two years from now. It could happen a decade from now, but it will definitely happen in our lifetime. Yeah. All right. I'm and, gonna... and, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, yeah, this, 
you know, people talk about past lives, future lives, parallel lives, everything is now. And this is the only life that matters. While working as a nurse in the hospital, have you ever had any mystical or metaphysical experiences? Yes. Yeah, I've had a handful of them. Um, let's see. One of my most memorable was I had a patient who died in my arms and came back. Um, she was gone for like 20 seconds. Her heart was stopped. And um, she got a glimpse of the other side. And before uh, dying, she had been a, a very anxious patient. She was very resistant to her hospitalization. She she just felt um, very, she was very apologetic, like uh, apologizing for having to be a, a patient in the ICU and, you know, I was just trying to comfort her and it's, it's okay, this, this is what we do. And, you know, and, and then when she died and came back, she was just totally receptive, totally open and grateful and allowing. And um, when she left, she, she, she came back like, like, where am I? <laughs> she said, where am I? And I was like, you're in the hospital. What did you see? And she said, they told me, they told me, it's okay. You are royalty. We are all royalty. And I was like, who's they? And then that's when she, that it started to fade away for her. She wasn't meant to remember that she, but it was her, her soul family or the angels. You know, she was like glowing when she when she came back. And um, yeah, that was a pretty like just the energy that 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 happened when she came back was palpable. And um, yeah, that was a very interesting experience. And then I've had uh, other experiences like with death as well. Um, this was when I was still a student nurse. Um, my she wasn't even my patient. I just went in there because she was um, in need of help. She was screaming and afraid. And she had been in there um, because she. I think she had dementia. And um, so she was afraid. She was alone. She, would, she was tied to the bed for her own safety. And so I went in there to comfort her. And she was like, I... I'm going to be late. Where are my things? I need I'm gonna, I need to catch the ferry. I don't want to miss the ferry. And, you know, where's my son? Is he, you know? And so I asked her, you know, do you know where you are? And, you know, you're in the hospital, right? And she's like, yes, yes, but I need to get gather my things. Like, I don't want to be late. And so, um, you know, I comforted her, left, and about 20 minutes later for her, she ended up coding. And um, they attempted like two or three times to revitalize her, to resuscitate her. And I knew throughout the entire time she was not in her body. I knew she was not going to come back. And I instantly knew that she was talking about like the river sticks, you know? She was going to go on the ferry. She knew there was a part of her that knew she was leaving. So that was pretty cool. I thought, I thought it was very beautiful. That is interesting. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I've had other patients who, you know, in the ICU, um, some of them are um, terminal and are on hospice. And they see loved ones who come in. It's usually like in the corner. Um, they, they start talking to them and seeing them. And I had one who saw her, her dogs who were all around her bed. She was like, I know they're not here, but I can see them. They're, they're all around my bed, their little tails wagging. Um, yeah. So <laughs> when you see them doing that, do you feel like they are really seeing these beings or do you feel like they're kind of delusional or something? Oh no, I a hundred percent believe that they are seeing it. They're seeing it. And they, they, they're lucid enough to know that, you know, I know I'm not supposed to be seeing this sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just like as clear to them as you and I, you know, they're, they're in between, they're in between. So everything looks 
the same. I'm going to switch gears with you. Sure. You are also an author of a book of poetry called Eternal Love of Dream, God and His Beloved. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so that book, I, I decided to basically, it just, I had to give birth to it. I had to just let it out and I wrote it more for myself, but I also find it to be um, very activating for anyone who listens to it or who reads it. Um, and so I, that's basically me channeling like Rumi, Rumi, the, the Sophie poet and mystic, um, and talking about my experiences of the void, of the mind of God, of the light, of, um, you know, my visions of the future and just of the, the truest, most absolute who we are, who we are. That's, that's, that's all that is. Yeah. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they connect with you? Yeah, um, you can email me. Um, my email is elmore.anna at gmail.com. You can also reach me through my website, ascendwithanna.com. Those are the best ways to reach me. All right. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? Um, at the moment, um, I'm just working on the second and third uh, in the series of, of my Eternal Love of Dream series. Um, and other than that, I'm just, you know, working on sharing my knowledge and my wisdom and my experiences. We are all pieces of the puzzle, very necessary pieces of the puzzle. And so, yeah, that's about it. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Sure. Yeah. Um, just remember who you are. We are just pretending to be mortal. And heaven on earth is God's plan. It's going to happen. Mm. And yeah, just be kind, be fearless, be love, because that is who you are. Anna, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. My pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.